Welcome everyone on this new episode of Let's Talk Today. I'm super happy to be with Nilesh Salian. Nilesh, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Super happy to have you on the show. We're going to talk, of course, about data engineering, uh, but many more topics. Maybe for the people who might not know you, can you introduce yourself um, in a few words? Certainly. Um, I, I don't know if I fit exactly in one specific position, but I've been a software engineer for like uh, almost 10 years now. I've been mostly focused in data platform, data infrastructure, data product building. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, spent a few times in different companies and built the different things started from 2014 right up to now. And uh, yeah, happy to share my journey and talk about topics. Awesome. Super happy to have you on the show. Uh, so when I was researching a bit on yourself for this podcast, uh, you've done many things, but I'm really interested in what people are doing, like the state of the art of people's. <laughs> so what is your state of the art? What are you currently very interesting, passionate uh, about? Um, I'm curious about databases, personally speaking. Uh, eventually, I want to do something in that line, but I haven't had the time to explore but uh, in my current job, I'm focused on building observability tooling. So uh, it helps me learn a lot of uh, large scale systems, how to build uh, for customers and think about problems at large scale. So um, yeah, there's passion in this work. So I'm, I'm trying to uh, balance between both. That will definitely be one of my future upcoming questions. Um, so could we make a, a quick throwback to your career and kind of understand uh, the journey and how you arrived to uh, your position uh, to the at Salesforce. Uh, so can you share briefly like maybe key moments, highlights and, and some learnings uh, on your journey? Certainly, yeah. Uh, journey state goes back to 2014 when I joined Cloudera where um, this was like early days of these tooling like Spark, mm -hmm. MapReduce, very, very early days, uh, less mature. A lot of the use cases were still being developed as customers were looking at it and trying to fit it into whatever applications they're building for the business. And so a lot of that uh, was really helpful for the choices were there. there. There was a lot of tooling out there. Even today, there's a lot of tooling to choose. But back then, it was it was still being grown. It was still being uh, developed as an industry. Like Hadoop was the big thing back then. And so I worked a lot with large-scale customers who were deploying these things at their on-prem solutions and trying to get their business uh, Sort of thinking about data more more uh, mindfully uh, than before. So it, sort of I saw that shift coming into how the industry started thinking and giving more importance to data as a, uh, as a whole. Mm -hmm. After that, I moved to Stitch Fix, where it's an e-commerce company but relies heavily on data. So I was part of the data platform team that built uh, a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the tooling that supported data scientists who were doing uh, a lot of the machine learning, a lot of the recommendations, and uh, Part of that was building tooling like Spark, at Presto, eventually Trino, touched a lot of like Iceberg, Hive, these kinds mm -hmm. of tooling. Mm -hmm. uh, though, and our goal was to make sure it's abstracted away, cleanly away from um, uh, the users and they don't have to see all of the quote unquote ugliness behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, that uh, after five years, I wanted a change. I moved to DBT where I did two things. One was like mostly architecture, technical strategy, sort of my first like, jump into technical leadership, learning a lot of like cross-functional uh, projects and helping out the org uh, at that level. And then also was leading the adapters team towards the end. And then uh, the summer I moved to Salesforce where I'm part of the observability team, which is actually building tooling for customers to see their own like logs, metrics, traces, and take insights of that and see how their applications are running uh, mm -hmm. within their stack. And so... My journey has been sort of mixed in terms of tooling, but the principle has been the same. It's sort of been around the data infrastructure and data platform uh, general space, if you will. Hmm. I see. There are many directions to take from here. To to come back into the, the present, so that's a big overview, and, and I'll come back and, and ask you a few questions on, on all those concepts that you mentioned. Um, um, like the fact that you've played with all this technology, the leadership role, um, like all of this, I believe we can get very interesting insights from you. you you're now um, working on observability on the observability team for MuleSoft at Salesforce. Um, so how how did your background lead you to observability? And maybe can you can you introduce yourselves um, a bit uh, around observability in general? 
Certainly. Um, observability is, it has multiple definitions, at least in, in my respect, it is giving you insights of things that you may ignore or may, may not see, like, um, and presenting it into, into that's more convinced, uh, consumable and queryable and can derive insights on how things work. So uh, the, the different aspects of that is how you collect the data that you need. And so, which is, it can be metrics that you're caring about, the machines that are running. It can be log data that your either applications are running on or the machines themselves, like audit logging as well, and traces to see how uh, requests go and how deep they can go if you set up those uh, spans correctly. So essentially collecting and cleaning up the data, making it presentable, making it insightful. That's the whole challenge um, in, in observability. And so how how teams and how companies have thought about it is uh, bringing in that uh, data that is valuable to the customer from their own uh, applications and presenting it to them, making sure they're able to see and visualize uh, that data. That is the key aspect of building observability tooling. Mm -hmm. And my experience at sort of large-scale distributed systems, um, Spark, Hadoop. Um, I didn't do much of Kafka, but uh, it's sort of, I dabbled with it a little bit and Flink as well a little bit. And so all of that sort of played within the uh, the, the sort of application that I gave and I was talking to them and it sort of made sense because I touched all these tooling and I had sort of experience in that. And uh, so it seemed like a fit uh, going from there. Yeah, inside, when I come in, I'm learning, I'm actively learning, I'm looking at how customers are interacting with the platform, how, what are the complexities, what are the scale problems, what are the issues that we're dealing with at this kind of complexity and scale, and um, yeah, trying to make it better, trying to improve it, trying to release it, trying to new, release new features. So it's a it's a bit of a journey that I've sort of started on. Um, so yeah, this is my first foray into observability in general, but uh, the principles of ingestion and sort of moving data is is pretty much standard uh, from my experience. Mm, awesome. This is something I've been meaning to, to ask you. Um, I listened recently to the keynote of the CTO of AWS and uh, and you have, uh, you have this notebook called the Frigal Architect and uh, you have some principles and so on and, and he talks about building with costs in mind and you've been building architectures for a long time now actually working on observability uh, do you have like first principles or lessons uh, when you come to finding a solution or tracking a problem or building new things um, like how do you go about this the process like do you have some experiences that you could uh, share with us where where like you follow a certain uh, certain number of rules or first principles um, that allow you to to be to iterate to be consistent and to get feedbacks and and to grow in the in the right direction maybe this is a big of a question but do you have some 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 insights for us regarding that yeah, there's no one size fits all for for all of that, to be honest. Um, yeah. But the the key thing I've learned over the years is making sure you can gather enough context. Like any problem that is thrown to you, it's either uh, very clear or very ambiguous. It can be anywhere there. And then it's your job to identify what the problem is, how the context is, what you're actually building, because the building part comes very late. Like once you've understood, you've devised a solution, but unless you've got that right, the, the building doesn't shouldn't start. So whether that's in debugging, whether that's in implementation, um, I think the, the requirements and understanding the pain points you're solving, whether it's stakeholder or customer or whatever, you have to understand what you're building. And so that's the one overarching principle of my, my career, I would see like, how do you get that context to, to make sure that you're a doing the right thing and you're doing that right thing at the moment. So it's, um, so that's the one thing, but otherwise software engineering principles are older than <laughs> me. And so I, I sort of relied on knowledge I've gathered across my career, emulating people. I've seen people write good code. I've seen art designs of my colleagues and uh, folks who are sort of more experienced than me and sort of learned from them how they think about problems and sort of tried to coach myself and read and learn from them. So recently I started reading a lot of white papers. So I'm like learning how architectures work underneath for more complex situations and how to describe them. So there's a lot of communication aspect also that comes from it, but 
yeah, I think I'm I'm constantly learning. Even in this, it, there's no perfect time where you're saying you've done everything and uh, there's no more learning left. But I think uh, I've had the fortune to have a lot of good colleagues and um, good problems to solve over my career, and so that has taught me different lessons across uh, across the almost ten years that I worked in. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, like finding finding inspiration and finding talented people that can guide you plus adding like software engineer first principles and so on. Um, very interesting. And so if I were to ask you about, um, about like tools, you, you've played with a lot of uh, big data tools. And by that, I mean, uh, I mean, Apache, Hive, Spark and so on. Um, so, I'd like to ask you about the state of the art. Uh, you've seen the field evolve for some time. Uh, it seems to me that the data engineering field doesn't evolve as fast as the data science team uh, field, sorry, uh, with like uh, recent, like every week there is a new LLM out and so on, even though it could be defined as hyped. But uh, like with a retrospective, how do you see um, like the evolution of those tools and what the futures m might look like do you do you believe that uh, like the main things are here or or have you seen some advancements lately that i have uh got quite your attention that's a good question i think i don't know i've never been successful at predicting these things like i've seen trends but they they don't always pan out sometimes but Spark has been the consistent thing that's been part of my career from the beginning. Like I touched it first in 2015 and it was amazing to see at the beginning, like when we came out of MapReduce and, but all these tools, they come with a lot of hard problems to make it digestible, make it actually uh, usable within an infrastructure. And that's what the pain I learned at Stitch Fix firsthand because we built custom infrastructure to support our Spark needs in-house. And so you sure it was backed by EMR, but a lot of that plumbing, that that infrastructure, the tooling, the services that actually made it successfully as an ecosystem that needed to be built. Sure, you can mm -hmm. pay a vendor, you can do all of that, but these tools are uh, very complex. Take Kafka, take uh, Flink, take all of these large scale tooling. They're very useful. They're very powerful, but it takes a lot to to get um, to sort of managed or at least have uh, have an ease of deployment. And I think that's where. Most of the SaaS and most of the businesses are coming now. I'm seeing a lot of Flink coming up. Like Flink has been older than Spark, but it's now sort of creeping into this uh, streaming world as it is. Um, it is technically more pop popular or even better, but managing it again is the is the is the challenge which a few companies are tackling. I'm seeing a little trends going into a lot of Postgres coming in, managed Postgres being one of the things um, distributed. Databases are always going to be there. And uh, what else? I'm seeing a lot of Kafka improvements, a lot of like IO improvements, a lot of S3 being used uh, to be the back end of pretty much everything. The I don't know if you saw the news recently about Express One, which is the new like S3 uh, storage standard. And like while, while the cost doesn't make sense, but eventually I think as costs lower, I think these will be viable options to actually rethink maybe larger systems that we already had and so even my interest from databases comes from like how the storage systems work do storage systems are are they optimized for current current disks so current solid state drives uh they've been the principles are from the magnetic era and so a lot of that so these are the like few things that i'm noticing in the market in general like reading tweets reading papers reading people's mm -hmm. blogs mm -hmm. and so Honestly, I don't know. This could go any direction. And AI is more on the application side, to be honest, like how you make that better. But the underlying principles are still going to be data engineering right. and like scale, complexity, making sure these things work uh, for your company. These challenges are not going to go away. Mm -hmm. But with AI, you have the ability to enhance that and give more insights and more value to the customer. And so I think building that cohesive platform will, will take a long time and that'll, that'll be valuable at the end. So it's an investment I think companies are starting to do now um, right. along, with the, uh, along with the industry as a whole. Right. Awesome. 
Awesome. If I push more on like predicting the future, uh, so so you're now working um, a lot on, on observability, and observability to me is fascinating because I believe that uh, like if we reach uh, a certain level in observability and we combine it with uh, what we commonly lately call AI, <laughs> um, I really believe that can be very powerful because you can just like make an agent or multiple agents that just communicate between each other and like get things done and have the overview of everything, uh, which uh, is an interesting idea. But without going into science fiction <laughs> too fast, uh, like do you have do you have kind of a, a feeling, a vision of um, what happened lately in data observability and and like maybe if you have uh, a feeling of where it could be going and what are you most interested in? Um, to be honest, I, I I just came into the industry specifically for observability, but, uh, but I think the problems are still going to be right from the ingestion part, right to the storage, to the to the actual um, making it possible to, to query. That's still a very like scale and complex problem. Like people... Um, like Datadog has somewhat perfected it. There are other tooling, but um, but yeah, even like if a company wanted to build that in house, it would take a lot of effort. It would take a lot of expertise to build it and perfect it. So I think a lot of the problems might be still building and like uh, getting it ready for the for the next phase. I don't even know what the next phase is to be honest. Like in our world, we're we're still getting to a complete view. At least in my team, we're getting to a place where we can give this whole suite of tools for, for our customers to make sure they're productive and they can use these observability data. But uh, it takes time to build these across customers. We have a large suite of customers who are uh, uh, depending on our tooling. And so building that complete solution takes time, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of iteration, actually, because we've come from like a version uh, before and we're expanding on it, we're improving. So all of these lessons, at least at the enterprise scale, they're constantly going to be evolving. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't paid attention a lot to startups and things like that, but like startups typically end up paying a vendor for observability and handle it, ha hand it over to somebody else to do it. But uh, but I think it's as cost and budgets start tightening up eventually, uh, macroeconomic conditions or otherwise, I think people will start looking at observability more closely and seeing how we can employ deploy something within our own ecosystem can be built something. And yeah, I think that's an investment somebody has to make um, for time and effort. Um, but yeah, I'm. it has promise. Uh, honestly, I wanted to read Observability Engineering. There's a book, I just started it, but I, I didn't manage to finish it. But uh, that has good lessons from people who've built this tooling over the years. So uh, I'm keen on reading that and learning more. But uh, yeah, honestly, I can't predict the future. I think it's still gonna be evolving and improving the current experience. and keeping an eye on cost as well. Awesome. Um, makes sense. Um, so from, I'm curious about, um, so you have a sub stack where you share a lot, uh, you share a lot of information, uh, valuable information on your data engineering uh, pass. But before asking you about your, your sub stack, I'm curious about uh, a few things not directly data observability. Um, all right, let me let me rephrase. I'll come back to this idea after this one. But um, so I understand better. I, I believe that it's um, very hard to predict the future in this fast growing industry. I believe that so many things are happening too fast. Um, You've been writing for some time now on your Substack and uh, you're sharing this journey uh, about data engineering and you have all these concepts and so on. Uh, so my question to you is, um, why did you start writing on Substack and like, like how does it help you be a better professional in your, in your daily basis? Yeah, Substack actually came... I started writing a year and a half ago, I think, when I when I joined my my previous company, and uh, that uh, that came out of like my 
my urge to write. Like I wanted to write a lot of content before, but I didn't have the opportunity or hesitated. Like honestly, I created that Substack like six months before I actually wrote that wrote out the first post. So uh, there was a lot of hesitation before putting out content, like how people will perceive it and things like that. And so I just wrote it. Like I wrote my interview experience. I wrote how it, it ended up becoming less sort of technical, more of like personal journey and like um, how things, per- how I perceive things more, more in that way. Um, I want to go more in the technical route and actually dedicate one specific Substack to, to, to technical content, which I'm currently working on. I have not uh, uh, completed that vision yet. And so I eventually want to release it, but that Substack alone um, helped connect with a lot of people, a lot of readers. Uh, I still get pings from people where like, Hey, I've read your work. That's great. Thanks for sharing. So I'm glad that helped add value. That's the, that was my entire goal. But it helped me to answer your question, uh, becoming a better communicator, like in terms of writing, in terms of uh, skills of uh, how to communicate via the written word, because that's hard. Like I've, uh, in my previous life, I've learned, emulated people, learned from books and things like that, how to communicate. But when you actually write, when you actually put thought down to words, that's where the challenge is. Like, how would people read it? How is it clear enough that you can make sense so I used to even share it to my wife. I'm like, hey, does this make sense before I used to release it? And so mm-hmm. she used to give me first-hand feedback. She's like, hey, what, this doesn't make sense. So I used to rewrite it and things like that. So right. um, I think it's good to it's good to try it out, especially if that's what I would recommend to people, whether it's personal content, whether it's technical content, whatever, it's great to write because it, uh, it opens up a lot of avenues for you in terms of networking, in terms of your own sh- skills being sharpened. Honestly, I don't care about like subscribers and things like that. If nobody comes, that's fine too. But but if if it actually helps me learn more, because every post needs a lot of research, a lot of time. So it helps me learn uh, new different things about myself or the technical uh, pieces that I write about. So right. I think it's valuable to to be honest, and it's helped me in terms of just improving things communication wise for me. That's the biggest lesson I think I will take away. Awesome, amazing. I try to write more like in yeah i believe that this exercise is very humbling and uh (laughs) sharing it online is like you you play the card of accountability and you need to to do your research and and i believe that it's amazing so i look up to what you're doing and trying to make great content um speaking of adding value you've contributed to um a different open source project if I'm not mistaken, including Spark and Hadoop. Um, could you share some insights on the projects you've been working on open source? And like, how do you see open source in general? Yeah, that's uh, my open source journey started a while ago when I was in Cloudera. We, was, we were very focused as building open source tooling and bringing it to customers. So there was clearly a path of benefiting from open source and the, right. the, product, the projects that were uh, available So that culture was still ingrained with me, at least like I love open source in terms of uh, building tooling, distributing it and actually giving the value to people um, immediately and like getting feedback. It's also some companies use it now as a growth uh, strategy to actually put out there and then see if there is buzz and then go out and build a SaaS company around it. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's really valuable in terms of um, uh, just for the community to benefit from something that you invent or something you build. And like when I was doing Spark and stuff, I was doing like tiny patches, documentation, small things here and there, like towards the end of of my journey here, like I was doing things on DBT, things on Iceberg, Hive, specifically things that were needed for the business. Not uh, not like started, it started off more personally, like trying to get more uh, understanding of these projects, but it ended up being more close to work. So if I had to fix something in our internal repo at Hive, I used to go back and put it into uh, the main Hive as a patch. So that that's where my relation became more work centric, and then feeding it back or using open source than uh, than very heavy contribution over the years. But uh, I've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot of uh, I made a lot of connections, a lot of networking, um, learned a lot from the interactions I've had with open source. It's a mm-hmm. vibrant community. Typically you take any projects, there's a lot of people involved. Um, so there's a learning opportunity. There's a connection opportunity as well. So I think it's really beneficial if you really want to jump in. 
yes, if they're like, if you want to become like a dedicated person, a committer and things like that, it'll take dedicated time and effort to build trust in that community. So that's something I've not had the bandwidth to do ever. And so uh, it's, uh, if you think it's valuable, if you'd like to con- continue contributing, it's, it's a great opportunity for yourself, for your career to continue doing that. So I think it, it's up to the individual, but I really see it valuable to, to go back and contribute to open source so that uh, you learn something and it's really, uh, really rewarding. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about prioritization and adding value to customers and iterating. Um, so you mentioned a bit earlier when you have multiple, um, like finding the right time to do the right things. And so that's very interesting to me, but it is also overwhelming. And sometimes <laughs> sometimes we're like, all right, how do I prioritize all of this? So we have like metrics, like like impact uh, impact and how difficult it is to to build and so on but do you have some first principles or tips about um both technically and on a more leadership high level perspective because i feel to just to give you a bit more context on on, on what i mean with this question i feel like there are this high level thing where we are able to map out what's going to what's going to happen, what we can do, what are the possibilities and like not starting doing code at some point. And then when we're in the code or when we're in the releases, like getting feedbacks, making sure everything's get down on on time, but maybe sometimes things don't go as planned and we face an issue. And so having kind of your overview or your framework or model or whatever you have for us <laughs> on, on this big picture of prioritization, um, either in leadership or technical, technical tasks. Yeah, it's, it's not a trivial problem um, in different companies. Like it, there's multiple factors, company size, company process. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, fa- there's a lot of variables that go into, the, into that. So there's no perfect answer, but what I've learned is, um, it goes back to the requirements piece I, I mentioned earlier. It's understanding the the problem itself and understanding also urgency as well, because um, that determines solution, the time to implement, and the roadmap that you mentioned earlier to design. Like you, because if if it's one person, if it's few people, you can come together and like deliver something. If it's like customer facing, that's a whole different roadmap that you're planning, you're delivering, you're guaranteeing something. So there's different prioritization in, in each like internal customers. You might have a little more leeway, but in like enterprise or like front facing customers, mm-hmm. you might not have that kind of leeway. So mm-hmm. it all depends on what is the, so- what is the solution you're building? Because yes, things can go wrong. Things can always, uh, uh, there's unforeseeable things that can happen. You can always push around, uh, make sure things are uh, adjusted. But uh, I think a lot of that, planning phase is important like de-risking a lot of that stuff so one of the one of the things i've tried to implement in my previous company was pre-mortem uh, which is a concept from Spar- uh, uh, sorry from stripe which is when the team gets together and de-risks the project and understands what could fail when it's implemented when it's actually being built and so they come out with scenarios that can help them understand oh these are the things that might come up as we're building this and they can plan accordingly so it's not necessarily a, a catch-all for everything. You will still slip and find something, but at least you have things to be aware of. So if anything goes sideways, you can plan and actually keep some buffer alongside. So if doing that exercise, I don't know how many odds actually do that, but if they do it, it's better to outline these challenges and processes early on so that you can understand where you have to give buffer, where things can go wrong. So that adjusts your timeline accordingly. But if it's a security thing, if it's a patch, if it's a bug, those things always take priority. So it's always, that's in a totally different bucket to me, to be honest with you. Like if something is broken, a customer experience or a bug, those things always get first priority versus like features that are long drawn, take a lot of time. And some, a lot, some of them people, some of the companies even do it based on days. Like suppose if you're releasing it to your conference, there's a lot of priority there as well. So yeah, it's it's kind of a mix. I, I don't want to give a non-answer, but it's essentially giving um, 
like understanding the urgency and the importance uh, before committing to time and the the challenges that you could face. I think in a nutshell, if I wanted to summarize that. Mm, makes sense. Yeah. Having the right metrics based on the situation and and planning accordingly. And I really like the, the techniques that you mentioned at Stripe. And I feel like these kind of things will be really enhanced by agents. And like if you have like multiple expert agents that are very expert on strategies of de-risking, and then you share all the roadmap that you're going to implement with like technical jargon and so on. And then it will like think, maybe sometime hallucinate, but it doesn't matter. You just remove it. But it will think for you and maybe think of things that we haven't thought before. And I believe that here, that observability, if we iterate this and adding in the next uh, de-risk, um, adding what we missed before and the lessons learned, I believe that there is a lot to, to get out of this. Um, do you want to react on this? Yeah, I think um, the hallucination part has to sort of subside. I think it'll 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 come there. It'll come to a point where the responses are much more coherent and much more correct, if you will. I, I think that'll take time, model training, rebuilding things. Like um, I don't know when, but mm -hmm. if that happens, I think more of the more of the applications would benefit from from the AI uh, AI models under uh, underneath because. Um, to actually put it in front of customer facing or really public use cases, you have to have that trust in the in the response that you that you get from these things. And so, I think that's the important part to build. Um, and that de depends on multiple factors, like whether your data is um, qualitatively sound underneath. Like if it's built on data that's actually correct and uh, it's trained trained with parameters that are correct. So. I think um, I'm not an expert in this field, so I don't know the the depths of it. But I think the uh, time will time will be the the factor here to how to improve these things. Uh, like it's been a year, and ChatGPT has given up so given out so much value to people, people to build businesses. Uh, it's it's very easy to make people productive. But uh, I think the next phase is going to be improving on that and just making it better. I think to to actually have the trust in in the responses and um, yeah. Hmm. Awesome. I'll ask you afterward. I have a an interesting question uh, that uh, I was curious to ask you about, but after this one, I'll ask you about um, like data engineer, data scientist relationships, or um, data engineers. Well, there is MLOps here that I want to feed somewhere, or AI engineers, or whatever new names comes up. But I'm really curious about these relationships. But before that, I wanted to ask you about through your career, um, you, you've worked with many clients, you've heard different kind of problems, either technical, high level, and etc. Do you have do you have some pitfalls for us that you've seen or that you've heard of that could really save time if people had took into consideration one metric or one thing. Do you have any 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 use case or any knowledge of uh, things that you've commonly see uh, as, a, as an advanced data engineer that people do some errors or forget about and then end up uh, like paying for it either with time or fixing or debugging or whatever it is? Yeah, there's no. Uh, it's hard to predict a lot of these things as well. Like as you, uh, as we've discussed earlier, um, like pitfalls can come in in different fashions. Like you might have not anticipated something that I think comes from um, either not anticipating, not even actually planning the project. Like we just spoke about de-risking, but a lot of that, I don't think I can give you like straight bullet points because every experience is different. Like I've learned different lessons along the way and um, I can share some, but they may not be applicable in every situation. But uh, pitfalls would be not having feedback, not having alignment, not having a lot of uh, trust built between between the stakeholders. That's like a really bad thing because, well, because that'll sort of make it harder to deliver, to deliver that product, to deliver experiences that you're building. So I think the key part building there is relationship and trust amongst 
the people you're solving. So that relation is really important to to solve. So I, that's the one thing I do when I when I join a company. I start talking to people. I start making relations, understanding what people work on, what people do, just a casual conversation. So that helps strengthen the relation as you deliver, as you work together. So that's a really, really important thing to consider because um, in my experience, that's been really helpful to uh, do things along the way. And then it's it's just a smooth journey after that. Not necessarily, but like you'll hit bumps here and there, but it's... It's easier to do when you know the person, when you have that uh, the trust built uh, alongside uh, alongside them as you work, mm-hmm. uh, rather than having to like sort of keep keep building that or like have that relationship a little bit more strained. So I think that's that's one one key pitfall I think people forget. And then I think um, second one is communication. I think because that can do good and bad for your project. Like because if you like even the the aspect about roadmap planning, the the challenges that you see, it's good to be transparent. It's good to be communicative. Over communication is okay. Like in the more people will know about it, it's it's great. Like, but give them enough information that they can either go to some place and read it, or your step your update has everything. So that's mm-hmm. that's one thing that I've noticed people don't do. I've I've had that lesson told to me as well because I've sometimes worked in a silo and not like communicated sometimes. So that's bad because people don't know statuses. So I think that's also a good, good pitfall to remember about because uh, not everybody keeps track of everything. So communication is really important, whether it's how you update constantly or even when you initially pitch the idea. So every, every aspect of that communication in the, in the workplace is really important. So Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think these are the two that come to mind in terms of relationships and trust building and the communication part uh, that can both can both can go wrong and sort of derail things. So I think it's important to consider both. Hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. And so if I take uh, those two, so you mentioned communication. Um, I would like to come back to this leadership perspective. I'm thinking about code review and documentation. You mentioned that you did some documentation uh, uh, when you were working on open source projects and so on, and, and, and like like I think do- doing documentation on, on big open source projects is like uh, for anyone. Uh, like right now, I should do documentation, I guess, just to like get more into the open source community and so on. Um, what's the importance of documentation? And I'm not referring necessarily in documenting code, but in general. Like, do you have a particular relationship with uh with, with documentation and uh and then and then I'll ask you well if you want to include also like leadership code review and all these kind of things like do you have first principles or things that you've seen through time that uh, were really effective or not uh, do you have some insights here? Going on documentation, I think it's it's really important for like yourself and people who you think might be the audience. Like I, I'll give you an example. Like one of the times I was, uh, I documented something that I built. Like I was in charge of building the Hive repository inside uh, my previous to, previous company actually. Mm-hmm. And uh, how we built that, I built like a workflow that you can take different versions and then dynamically build that um, as you pull in the repo. So we used to have maintain a private repo of Hive. And uh, I just documented it. I'm like, hey, this is the process. This is if you want to make a patch, here's it. Is. If you want to make a release, a binary, then here's the process. Go, go, kick off this workflow. And uh, that really came in handy when we had like a log4j outage in December of 21. When uh, uh, I just had gone for a vacation, and when I landed in Mexico, I saw that vulnerability news, and then my colleagues were pinging me like, hey, wait. Are, uh, what are the things that are broken? I'm like, go read this, <laughs> go go read this document for Hive and just 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 rerun it and make sure the versions are okay. So, in my experience, I think maintain for yourself and your your audience or whoever is going to benefit, it's really useful to to document that way. So, in the absence of that, they wouldn't know because I was away or in, let's say in another situation, multiple people were away. Without that documentation, I think it's really hard to to get uh, sort of like in the absence of people, it becomes really valuable. So that's one example. And even 
um, just for sheer making sure, like a, there's a customer facing documentation, which is also really important. This is what I spoke about was internal, but customer facing, it's, it's important of how they can experience the product, how they can experience um, what you've presented to them and what kind of, let's say it's an API, like what are the parameters? What are the expected responses? What are the, so it's all about making sure you give su sufficient uh, information to whoever you're presenting, whether it's internal or external. So that's the key part that people uh, miss out on documentation. Um, and that's important because I think uh, code is fine to an extent, Like, but not a lot of people will dive into the code. They care about the experience. They care about the, the surface level product. So giving them enough information there that can get them unblocked, get them successful, I think that's that's really valuable. And mm -hmm. to your point about code review and things like that, I Honestly, there's no general uh, principle there. It's all uh, company dependent, um, situation dependent, but I like to sort of be kind, I think, in code reviews, like just to be mindful, like uh, be coaching, be helpful, uh, because it's really valuable to like, like nits and things like that is not really something I, I do a lot, but I go in and like, okay, can we do this better? Can we do this? Is this like questions? So I think, it all comes from the culture of the team that is actually doing it. So that, that dictates how you work with yourself, how you work with your team, how you work with external people who's making changes. So it all depends on how you want to present that and how you want to guide people to do it. So, and even as you grow higher up in the ladder in career, it's a good way to help junior engineers or people who are like still growing in their career to mentor them and coach them in the right way, because these things can be overwhelming. These things can be really uh, hard to do at the first time. So without that right coaching, I think it's really uh, difficult to, to pursue. So I think you can take it in different angles. You can take it in the way of being kind, being very mindful, and also on the coaching side of things where you can actually be helpful to people who are trying to learn and actually add value. So there's multiple aspects to that in terms of, uh, uh, code review specifically. But yeah, I think uh, every culture, every company is sort of uh, different. They, they might be different experiences. I've, I've worked with multiple employers. I've saw somewhat different cultures in different uh, different places. So it's not very consistent. But overall, I think these are the lessons I think I can take away specifically on code review. Hmm. Yeah. And I feel like having this person one can look up to, um, like, myself for example like knowing that i have some people where i can just push something that i've been struggling with and just get like cold feedback i mean not cold in a mean way but like just no bullshit in a way that right this sucks <laughs> like having this kind of feedback i feel is amazing because like it just reset but it makes me grow way faster because if I don't have the feedback or if maybe like I don't have this um, kind of mentor figure that can put this, the, the quality bar, then the quality bar sets itself from the average of everyone. And I feel that this is not only good for what a team is building, I mean, not not good <laughs> but also um but also for the growth of the individuals it's very bad because um i mean this is obvious what i'm saying but like having this person that can briefly in a short time explain me what i need to focus on to make this okay or to make this good is um is a very uh, big time um it's time effective it's uh it makes win a, gain a lot of time uh so just wanted to reinforce from the um there's a reviewer you're reviewing my code <laughs> so i need this feedback um that's awesome and you mentioned something that i wanted to come back on which is the documentation um for users so like do you when you do users call do you create logs of the call with the users taking notes and detailed feedback on how they experience the project or like how do you go about users calls i mean there is a lot of documentation 
Paul Graham's essays on this and like many things to talk about the users, but I always love to, to, to hear more. So do you have things, special things that you've learned and can share with us on speaking with users and getting feedback and keeping track of this and making sure it's aligned with the bigger goal? Yeah, my, my experience directly with the customer came from my cloud air days where it was very close to like few large customers where we we used to have like regular check-ins with them, making sure they're consistent, making sure they're uh, they're okay. So a lot of that involved calls and status checks, uh, meetings with sales, meeting with their their account managers and things like that. And so it was it was a very like dedicated relationship with the customer. This was one of the large customers that Cloudera had, and so it was. Um, Yes, involved a lot of documentation, internal notes, internal like um, tickets and things that they raise, things uh, things that they are concerned about, and even provide them like with updates of the projects and uh, things that we release. So let's say they usually get like a blast of email or whatever that says about hey product updates, but reinforcing that as well also also makes sense because if you notice if you have a working relation them uh, relationship with them. Did you notice they're coming end of life of certain versions? If they have use cases that they tell you about, then you can recommend different paths to take and different products and different releases and updates that they can be use uh, that can be useful for them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that comes from building that um, history and relation with the client and the customer, so that you can not perfectly, but at least anticipate the need that they have based on use cases that might come up that they might say. So I think that's really valuable to to engage with them periodically and have a cadence meeting or even show up at their site. Some some customers were uh, open for uh, people to show up on site and talk to their to teammates and understand what their experience is. So that's a really good method of getting feedback directly. So I've gone on site to the customer that I was dedicated to and then worked with them on problems and um, resolve them and come back. But uh, but yeah, it's I think. I think it's really valuable if you keep uh, keep that close connection with your customers so that you have a channel of feedback that's constantly coming to you. And also it helps you grow in the product and helps them keeping more engaged with what they're, what you're releasing so that they're aware. And that relationship stays, it's always, it stays and it's always helpful for the business to grow, mm -hmm. but it's also engaging for them to keep, uh, keep putting the effort and they can learn more. They can enhance their, their existing business as well. So I think, uh, Net net, there's a lot of uh, a lot of value in doing that. To be honest, mm. right. I mean, following up uh, on this, do you believe? I mean, there is no one way to do it. I guess it really depends on what we're building. But but would you be more of all right? New features. I guess you can divide. But when you share something new with a customer, and maybe uh, like you're sharing and you're getting feedback live. Um, do you believe that um, it is a common way to just give the new feature and see what happens or guide the users uh, to to use it? Or, or like I said before, like maybe try to see what's wrong if someone tried to use it in an intuitive form and maybe see those blocks and take them into account for future releases and then guide them after that you've seen that they were blocked at some point. Do you have some insights on this? That I think is typical in like software development lifecycle. Like you have beta releases, alpha releases, sorry, alpha releases, beta releases uh, that help you give the customers the early versions of these things. And so some of that behavior can come out of there and like early problems. Yes, you you typically won't ship everything correctly in those versions, but you will you will give them uh, the opportunity to give feedback and test this out. And if if you're really like the relationship part that I mentioned, if you constantly have that uh, feedback loop with the customer, then you can engage with them and understand how they perceive this new product to come out. Like whether it's a product line, completely different that they have to understand. Or it's something that you've changed or made breaking changes to a new be uh, an existing behavior. So both of them can trigger behavior changes. So mm -hmm. that I think is is a trial and error process. Like you have to go and engage and talk to the customer, learn how they behave, get feedback, and then feedback to that product. Like go back and improve it, understand these cases. If it's really absurd, if it, they're not acting in the right way or they're not perceived it correctly, 
it's either a messaging problem or something that they perceived incorrectly. So that you have to go back and adjudicate to understand where that mismatch happened of understanding, because mm-hmm. it could be they read something and misunderstood or the product is interface is confusing. Mm-hmm. So it could be a multitude of factors there because right. uh, so that's the parse process of learning. Like you learn these things as you grow and as you build, like even in startups, like startups give a lot of beta customers, get a lot of input from them. And that's mm-hmm. how they grow. They sometimes pivot based on what they hear. Sometimes mm-hmm. they grow in, uh, in the same line. So, a lot of that early feedback is really important, whether you're doing it in a, in a startup scale and an enterprise scale, customer facing, whatever. So I think really, really releasing it and getting that initial read of the project is really helpful for, for you to understand and constantly improve it. Makes sense. And yeah, you were right. This, were my, this, this, this question was were more like project oriented and, and it could include many many roles, front end, software, um, data scientists, and of course, data engineer and much more, uh, it's a party. So my question for you is, how do you feel, like, do you feel that there is a big gap between all these roles that exist? And by gap, I mean, for example, data scientists we speaks, will speak with specific words that maybe data engineer we use for other terms or, um, this kind of gaps of miscommunications between different fields. Um, and I'm specifically targeting data scientists and data engineers, but you can, you can add software engineers, you can, you, you can add ML ops, you can add front end, like whatever roles that might be kind of technical or even not necessarily, but like, do you have some lessons learned based on from a data engineer perspective, things that you've struggled with, or not you necessarily, but that you've seen? Do you have insights regarding that and like how you overcome them? I don't think I've seen it personally, but I think every every team comes with, a, with its own expertise line. And data engineering in general is a broad field. Like we didn't, right. when, I, when I started my career, I didn't even hear the term, at least uh, to be honest, it was, Software engineer focused on data. Data scientist was coming up as a, as a term. Mm-hmm. Data engineer was almost non-existent, or at least maybe in a different form. But um, it was not as publicly known or aware as uh, now. It's a whole uh, field. It's almost like a lot of facets within it. And so I, I think everyone has their own needs. Like uh, when I used to work at Stitchfix, we used to have two sort of classifications. One was data platform engineer. To think of them being the tooling people who do like software engineering plus data infrastructure. So a blend of that and data scientists who are pretty much all of the things you've listed, like ML engineer, AI, everything blended into one. So like a full stack data engineer, a data scientist. So their needs and their requirements were different. And we used to meet them by the tooling that we, we had to. So I think it uh, to make sure these things work in an organization, it's really important to understand each other's language or understand each other's needs. Like you said, like tr- terms might be different, but then underlying what those terms are. Let's say I want I want to build model training or I want to build a model registry. I want to build feature store. These are engineering problems. There's, they're very specific to a specific need, but then underneath them, you have to build solutions. So it comes down to a tooling thing. Mm-hmm. And so terminology aside, I think it's it's good to align with these teams and understand how one team can fulfill the needs of others uh, or vice versa. Or these, So there's typically a relation with these teams. And so understanding that makes makes really, makes really worth it in the organization. Otherwise, these teams will always be a mismatch and misunderstand each other. But if there's a relation, there's an actual uh, understanding of who builds what or who actually serves the, the needs of whom. So that that's I think is uh, is really important in this field because we'll have different we'll have different aspects in this field as as it grows. There's analytics engineer, there's analysts, there's DBAs, there's like a lot of people within the same um, um, sort of umbrella of data engineering. But I think as long as we know the boundaries or we know the roles that we play in this in this whole industry, I think that might be important to to go forward with because so that it doesn't become confusing. To be honest, like. Terms can be confusing, but as long as there's uh, the decent understanding of who does what or what tools serve each uh, each specific need and where the scope lies of each role, 
I think that's really important for them to be successful, uh, despite being chaotic. Like a lot of companies have much more teams than smaller companies do. And so uh, it's very important to draw the interfaces and the the ownership boundaries of those teams to be successful. Hmm. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, all right. I would like to ask you... Uh, so I think I have three more questions for you. And this is not calculated based on my questions. It's just that uh, these are like the three questions that I like to ask uh, kind of at the end of the episode. And the first one is, um, as um, for young data engineers like me, I could consider myself a data engineer at some point, sometimes. <laughs> uh, AI engineer, data engineer, I don't know. I'm lost with all those uh, funny words. Um, but I love everything of it. And so for young data engineers, then I'd ask you for more advanced data engineers, but um, people who are getting started in the field, what would you pay attention to? It can be technical in terms of languages, tools, uh, and, and frameworks and so on, but also like social skills and, and so on. So do you have tips? Honestly, tooling after a certain time doesn't really matter. Like right. the principles do. Like suppose mm -hmm. I'll take an example of orchestration. Like orchestration tools have been there for a long time, but mm -hmm. I've used one, I can understand the others. Like as long as you know the concepts and the fundamentals of each, like mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's where you should focus on because initially in your career, you won't get the perfect job. Like I'll, I'll be very honest about that. You will get a job that you may not be the perfect fit. It'll be something that, you got it, but then you're not happy. You eventually, some people find it. It's okay. But if you haven't found, or at least not passionate, try to learn as much as possible from wherever you are. So that's the, that's the lesson I will, I will at least advise to have because um, wherever you are, just take in as much as knowledge that is possible. Like learn from people, look at a lot of code, look at a lot of documentation, look at a lot of tooling, try getting the opportunity to work on different problems because that's how you grow. That's how you get more and more knowledge. And I'm not giving any specific uh, tooling here because you pick the tooling that you like or the problem area that you like, either dive deep or be a generalist. Either way it works, but make sure you have the knowledge that you need for to be successful. And yes, as you grow, you will learn more about the problem area or the space that you are in. But give yourself that time, give yourself that effort and start doing more, take more responsibility in these areas. And that's how you will progress in your career to, to actually hit where like 10 years later, you look back and say, oh, I learned these things. And so I think learning and the, just diving deeper and getting more uh, hands-on is really, really important for whatever you're trying to do, whether you want to be in more closer to the data, that's like data scientists, data analysts, analytics, or you want to build more tooling side. I went on the tooling side, so I know that, that area, but these are the two like main areas of, of data that I that I see. And so um, pick your pick your choice, but then start learning in that area and be 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 great at it. I think that's the, that's gonna be really helpful. And tooling actually comes and goes, but as long as you master things, don't don't get hung up on one or two tooling because tooling can get deprecated people can just like migrate off of it so always keep evolving as well like mm -hmm. i one thing i constantly do is try to learn different programming languages uh and read a lot of blogs about different things in the infrastructure so keep that learning going and keep yourself evolving because things can change you may end up in a different job that uses a totally different stack mm -hmm. so the learning that you took from your previous job is really helpful to apply those principles rather than go Oh, I only worked on Spark. I can't work on Flink. So it's it's kind of that. Don't bound yourself to those technologies unless you plan to go very deep in. Oh, I only want to do Spark optimization for ten years. Then that's a different thing. <laughs> but if you, if you want to be anywhere in the market that's like more broader, I think it's it's better to do lessons and knowledge first than than tooling first. Awesome. Makes total sense. And would you have some words for people who are more advanced? Like let's say five six seven like years into the field and like what would you look at in terms of you can be reading papers blogs do you have insights yeah i think that that's the that's the part i was covering about learning constantly evolving because yeah the the field itself is changing like there's more tooling there's more concepts coming there's always 
change in flight happening and everything. Mm -hmm. So to keep yourself updated is important. Like unless you're siloed in doing one specific thing and nothing changes in that area, then that's okay. You don't have to keep up with the entire industry. Mm -hmm. But if you are curious and if you want to learn and grow and be more of a generalist, I think it's it's best to keep yourself uh, knowledgeable and aware of things that are trending. And I'm not saying go daily and do a lot of this thing, but once a week, maybe read some blogs or papers or whatever that interests you and keep yourself a little bit more aware of things that might come up. And so that'll help you in your own thinking, your own like uh, evolution as a data engineer, uh, engineer generally, but it'll also give you ideas at work. Like, hey, actually this new thing has come up or this new technology, they're doing it in a different way. Maybe we can think inspired from there. So that all can be fed into your work, but then, but then unless you do that constant learning and evolution, you won't know a lot of those new things. So yeah, I think keep yourself um, uh, curious and learning is, is the, the only lesson I can give. Uh, that's what I do, honestly, to, to keep myself updated. Love that. Curiosity is, uh, is, uh, is awesome. And I, I love to like do mini project hands-on where I just try to break down a concept and I'll just take, all right, this tool, this tool, and this tool, and I want to do this thing. And I will do it at a very basic level. But once I've done it, I feel like I can scale it because now I understand it and I know how it should work and how it should look like and so on. Awesome. I remember having a message once where someone, wa I think um, this person was in the data science field and, and basically the message was uh, on LinkedIn saying that... Um, um, this person had studied data science, but uh, he was not uh, happy where he was. Uh, and so basically the feeling that I got from the message was, uh, I guess uh, I'll have to wait to do data science. And so my answer was kind of, you need to move things around and like build and do hands-on projects. And, and, and because like you said, when you get your first job, you won't get something that totally fits you because you might not know it yet, except if you've been coding since you're nine years old and you're fairly passionate and you have your entire open source community behind you because you've built so many great things. All right, but in other cases, maybe it's not like that. So I believe that having this hands-on and keeping it in a great understanding of how things uh, work and keeping a fit into what we're interested in is, uh, is key, like you said. Um, so I'm going to move to my two last questions, but do you want to react to, to this maybe? No, that, that's spot on actually. Yeah. I think, um, it's really helpful to continue learning, um, to just being, uh, yeah, just growing in your career. I think that'll take, uh, doing the projects that you mentioned are really helpful to learn concepts and things like I, I, I started learning go last year. So I pick up anything and just like start doing small code as well. But, um, but yeah, it's. It's really a good way to pave your own path because nobody's going to give you that perfect job. Like mm -hmm. you, if you are stuck or if you uh, are not feeling like you're growing, you have to still make that effort. But the industry is wide enough that you can find a place. But uh, yeah, you have to move the needle yourself, most likely, mm -hmm. because um, it's really it's really hard out there now, especially in the job market. It's really terrible. Mm -hmm. But in general, it is it has always been hard to find a perfect fit. So right, yeah. It's uh, challenging. And I feel like it is uh, uh, beneficial for both the companies and one for like doing this thing and taking this time because we improve, so we're better for the company, so we add more value. And so I feel like sometimes I hear people like who are very busy in a way that they have no more time left in their schedule to like do anything. And that to me seems dangerous because if you can't fit at some point some personal training whatever it is for you i'm not speaking about physical even though that would be also great but like training professionally like playing with things uh in google like i think they have their fridays off where they can play around with projects and so on and i feel that this is a, a very important thing for companies in general yeah time management is important like you you can set us out your own time control it and make sure that you dedicate some time to doing it. But uh, yeah, I think it's valuable to do that in the long run. Awesome. Two last questions. Where can people find more about yourself? So you're on LinkedIn. Do you have more things? Do you have your Substack? So 
yes, LinkedIn would be the best place to find me. And um, I have links in there for all my other social media. Like I, like I'm on Twitter as well, most most actively in threads. Uh, Substack, um, I sort of, I'm going to move away from that one and write a new one. So I'll, all right. <laughs> there's a link there if you're curious to read, but um, I'll, I'll write more in, in going forward in the future. Um, so I'll put that, put that up when, when needed. But LinkedIn is honestly the best place to, to reach out and connect. Awesome. Well, uh, last question. And I want to thank you, Nilesh, for your time and sharing all these amazing uh, tips. Um, so would you have a message for the Let's Talk AI community? It can be anything personal, professional, a summary of a conversation or something that you come up with. Yeah, I think, um, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to speak um, to you and the listeners as well. So it's, uh, thanks, uh, thanks to the Thanks to the time today, but uh, I don't know. I'm not prophetic or anything. Like I, I don't know how to give out a message and such to uh, to a large group of people. But I can just say that, um, uh, especially in data engineering, this uh, AI, these things are coming up. So a lot of learning opportunities is there for you to grow in your career. So I think it's it's imperative that you take advantage because um, a lot of the a lot of the like things are changing almost on a daily basis, so it's hard to keep up. But if you're passionate about something, just go about go about doing it and just reading about it and learning about it because that's how you will grow and benefit in the uh, in the long run. But the also other point of message I want to give is maintain some level of work life balance because the career that you want is not a it's not a sprint; it's a marathon. Like if you can sustain five years of running fast. You won't be able to do that for 20 years. So keep a balanced career, balanced uh, like approach to things because it can get very exhausting. At a certain point of time, you'll hit burnout, you'll hit those kinds of things if you haven't uh, balanced it out. So I think that's one advice I want to give out that um, it's it's really important to take care of yourself and take care of your um, like physical, mental health and uh, just to make sure that you can sustain the, the thing that you put yourself in through. So, but yeah, I think it's really important to enjoy yourself as well to do, as you as you go in and do these things because if you're not passionate, this won't work for you. Like you have to like the thing that you're doing, and so um, if you enjoy it, put your put your full heart in it and just go for it. That's all. That's all I can say. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. Love this message. I wish you to have a wonderful day, and I look forward to learn more from you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Take care. Ciao.